Welcome to BrainFluence. I'm Roger Dooley. Today's guest is a repeat visitor with some very timely insights. Gleb Zapersky is the founder and CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts and a thought leader in future-proofing and cognitive bias risk management. And we've had guests with PhDs in behavioral science on this show any number of times, but Gleb has a PhD in the history of behavioral science. Last time Gleb was on, we discussed his book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. His new book is Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams, a manual on benchmarking to best practices for competitive advantage. Welcome to the show, Gleb. Thank you again for having me back, Roger. It's a pleasure. Gleb, our last discussion was in December of 2019, and I went back mm -hmm. and actually checked the transcript uh, since you are the disaster avoidance guy, and nowhere uh, in our conversation did the word pandemic come up, no, uh, which is <laughs> kind of uh, funny because little did either of us know, but perhaps the, what, the biggest disaster that has faced us in decades was <laughs> right around the corner. When, mm -hmm. when did you realize, Gleb, that this was going to be uh, really a major event worldwide? <laughs> around early January of 2020. So I was starting to look at what was happening in Wuhan and this information started coming out about this pandemic and that the health system in Wuhan was collapsing. Now, people generally didn't pay much attention to this topic because it's kind of nowhere China, right? Another disease. But I naturally being interested in disasters, I started researching this topic. And I found out that Wuhan is actually a major city, huge metropolis. It's called the Chicago of China. It produces over $22 billion in revenue per year, has something like 11 million people living in it, and it has something like 500 international flights per day. So 10, 000, you know, 200 people per flight, 10,000 people going in and out. And this modern city, very modern city, with a good public health system, its public health system totally collapsed. I mean, they had to chain, put chains on people's doors, you know, nothing that they did in the US, but you know, in order to manage the situation. So it was really bad. And it became clear to me that this pandemic would get out of China and this would be a serious issue. I started talking to my retainer clients about this topic that you really need to start addressing this. You need to change your business continuity plan to not orient toward just, you know, two week interruption, which is the maximum, the typical business continuity plan, but for a long term interruption and for people working from home for a long period of time. And I started writing articles, op-eds. I started, I had articles published already in the beginning of March before the declaration of the emergency about the serious need to prepare for this, how businesses weren't prepared. And it was actually pretty hard to get them published because editors were not really interested in running them. They were thinking, well, this is exaggeration, but you know, it turned out to be pretty prescient. Had something published in the Business Insider, had something published about this topic in the Columbus Dispatch, Earl something like March 8th or 9th. And so this is something that was, I was watching this pretty closely and helping folks adapt, strategically pivot to adapt to the pandemic. I think that something that I noticed was that companies that were well down the digital transformation path actually, in some cases, were able to prosper during the early mm -hmm. stages of the pandemic simply because their competition wasn't prepared. We saw that in retail where some retailers were pretty good. Uh, Amazon was impacted, certainly, but uh, mm -hmm. they recovered very rapidly by adding massive amounts of people to their roster. Uh, and uh, other other smaller chains, supermarkets and such, uh, really did pretty well in adapting. Others, not so mm -hmm. much. But, you know, how does a business like a cruise line uh, deal with something like this or plan for it? I mean, I'm pretty sure that uh, the cruise lines did not have something in their uh, plan book about, well, what if suddenly uh, in you know, shipping shut down globally, uh, we could not have any, we had zero revenue coming in, mm. plus we had thousands of employees marooned on ships around the world that can't go home. Uh, who, who even plans for that or, or do they? That's a good question. One of the things that you can look at, so the cruise lines were one uh, thing, but they're not, mostly they're not an American business, but let's look at American business. Let's look at the airlines. They had huge profits over the period from 2008, 2009 to the beginning of 2020. What did they do with those profits? They give them back in the form of share buybacks to shareholders. So they had very little war chest available. 
And if the government didn't help them out, they would have gone bankrupt. <laughs> that is not the way to prepare <laughs> for a disaster. You need to have a serious war chest for something like this. And pandemic is a preventable disaster and foreseeable disaster. You can foresee that something like a pandemic might occur. This is something that prominent people like Bill Gates and many others were talking about for a while. So it's shockingly bad risk management that the airlines all follow the same fundamentally flawed strategy of not building up their war chests in case of an emergency and instead giving that money back to shareholders. That is a serious problem and is a sign of what's called market failure. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I've brought that up on the show before that uh, it really makes no sense. I w suppose if you ask the CEOs, they would say, well, uh, if we have a big pile of cash in our balance sheet, uh, people are going to come in and uh, attempt to ta either take us over or uh, elect uh, alternate directors to try and get that money distributed and so on. And also, I think there's the tendency of incumbent executives to say, wow, we can improve the stock price if we give out uh, dividends and share do share buybacks and such, uh, which, of course, benefits them personally. So, yeah, I, I, I agree. It's and it's, it's, you have the market, yeah. Wall Street, pushing companies to make bad decisions that don't manage risks effectively. Now, you have, of course, other companies on Wall Street, such as Berkshire Hathaway, which are holding on to a large chunk of money and made very well throughout the pandemic because they were holding on to a lot of money and buying up shares of destroyed companies at good lower prices. So clearly, risk management is on the side of people who foresee problems like Warren Buffett and their, versus the CEOs of the airlines, which were all following the same flawed strategy. And that's why you have this market failure when people are, CEOs are looking at quarterly profit reports and share price instead of the long-term future of the company. Right. Well, Warren Buffett wasn't trying to maximize his 2020 bonus. So, no. uh, and, you know, that's it's a fundamentally different uh, and far better approach to management. Now, Gleb, your uh, new book is about returning to work and uh, some of the various, and it's, it's really fascinating, the trade-offs. Uh, but first, I think I should interject that uh, we have a global audience here and mm -hmm. uh, the world is in different places right now as far as returning to work goes. Uh, in the U.S., uh, due to a pretty high vaccination rate, we're closing in on 70%, at least partially vaccinated, uh, things are largely getting back to normal. Stadiums are open, theaters are open, uh, and people are behaving more or less normally. Not, not that we've completely licked the pandemic yet, but uh, things are somewhat normal. And also businesses are coming back into the office, at least some of them are, because there's a perceived far lower risk than there was previously. Uh, but in different parts of the world, uh, things, are, things are very different. In Australia, uh, things never really uh, got as bad as they got in the U.S. and much of the rest of the world because they were striving for COVID zero. So, yeah, they had some lockdowns and whatnot. But basically, by closing off borders and a lot of testing, they were able to prevent the spread. So they were living normal lives mm -hmm. <laughs> during 2020, unlike many of us. But still other countries are in the midst of relatively serious outbreaks and a lot of risk still. So uh, with, with that in mind, though, uh, we will accept the fact that everybody will be sooner or later, uh, returning to the office in some fashion or things will be returning to normal. But we've seen this big divide develop where you've got some employees saying, well, I don't want to go back into the office, either occasionally for safety reasons, but also because, wow, hey, I find that I can work just as well from my remote office in my home that may not even be in the urban center where it was previously. Maybe <laughs> now it's in a distant, uh, you know, it's near a mountain lake. Uh, and I can be incredibly productive from here. But you've also got uh, CEOs who are saying, OK, nope, hey, uh, it's time to get back in the office. Uh, in your book, you mentioned uh, Goldman Sachs uh, CEO says uh, basically this is an aberration that we're going yeah. to correct quickly. Now, that's a pretty strong statement to say yeah. you know, this is this is just an error that we're going to fix right now. And uh, I thought uh, almost equally indifferent to the concerns of employees was uh, Jamie Dimon, uh, yeah. who I have a lot of respect for as a CEO, but uh, he said something like, uh, uh, yeah, uh, people don't like commuting, so <laughs> what? And, <laughs> you, know, yes. uh, you know, this this to me is a bit out of touch, but at the same time, 
uh, they are basically saying that this is our culture, you know, and maybe maybe our culture isn't for everybody. You know, if you're looking for work life balance, you probably don't go to Goldman Sachs to work. Right. Uh, that's that's not on uh, uh, really part of their culture, at least uh, for your first five plus years there. <laughs> maybe by the time you're a senior partner, your work life balance isn't so bad. But in any case, uh, you know, how. How do you go about uh, addressing these new issues where you've got uh, different attitudes on the part of employees? You've got some people who literally can't do their job remotely and others who can. You've got people who want to work from cheap places where, uh, but still want to be paid at uh, San Francisco or New York City prices. That's an important consideration. How do you manage fairness? And so we can focus on the workers who can work remotely. I think rather than people who are essential workers who need to be in the office, you know, doctors and so on, they can't do their work remotely. They can do some medical visits, but, you know, surgeons can't do their work remotely, right? You know, nurses and so on. So we're talking about people who can do their work remotely, all or most of it remotely. So let's focus on those folks. And that's about, that's just over 50% of the U.S. economy because there's a lot of service to the economy. In other economies, it varies, of course, more or less. So thinking about these people, we want to look first at what these people want. So kind of set up this divide between you know, Jamie Damon and his staff. But what does that statistics say? What does the average say? Looking at statistics, and there were a number of very good surveys done by places like the Harvard Business School, by the Society for Human Resource Management, very huge society, neutral, objective, not advocating for any sort of perspective. Microsoft, Slack, huge companies. And they didn't do only surveys. They also have data. Microsoft has data from Microsoft team and LinkedIn. Slack has data from Slack, all of this sort of stuff. And they looked at what do employees want, their productivity, what is actually going on with employees, just to provide a basis for our conversation. And what they find is that overwhelmingly, employees do not want to go back to Monday for Friday, nine to five, what Jamie Damon and Watts and other folks like that. So what they're finding is that about 60% or so, a little bit more or less in various surveys, want a hybrid schedule, coming into work one to two days a week on average and doing the rest of their work from home. Something like about... 30%, 30%, maybe a little bit more or less, depending on the company and situation, want to work full-time remotely. Only something like 15%, 10 to 15% want Monday for Friday, 9 to 5. So that's kind of the basis from which we're talking about. We want to know this is the average. When you're looking at what do people, how much do they care about it, something like 45% to 50% indicate They'll look for a new job if they're not given at least substantial remote work and some full-time remote work. So people really want this. On average, and this is to all people across all statistics, they want they are willing to give up 8% of their salary to work their preferred remote schedule. They Over 75% say that working remotely gives them more work-life balance, provides stress relief, they hate commutes, that's their top reason for not going to the workplace, and they find that they're quite a bit more productive. And that productivity is backed up by data from Microsoft Teams, from Slack, about how much people work. People work on average something like 20 hours more per month if they're working remotely. That's 10 to 14% on average increase in productivity. And it's not surprising, you know, you don't have a commute, you have much less kind of, you know, going through security, going through the office, just go to your, you know, go from your bedroom to your home office, right? And uh, do your stuff after your morning routine. So that is something that will, for the basis from which we're coming. So people really want to work substantial remote work, employees on average, whereas managers are much less enthusiastic on average about their employees working remotely. And there are a number of reasons why their managers are less enthusiastic. And they're making decisions based on their lack of enthusiasm. Interestingly, they're, even large tech companies are making these decisions. So Google, for example, wanted all its employees to go back to the office. All its employees to go back to the office. 
and I was talking about this, talking about this, you know, from January, February, starting from January, February 2020, saying in a few months, you'll all go back to the office. Well, guess what? Employees started leaving. <laughs> top employee, top tech folks started leaving Google because they didn't want to go back to the office. They moved elsewhere. They want, They found they can do, be very productive doing remote work. And Google, due to internal employee position and retirements, resignations, eventually reversed its decision on May 5th, said, okay, you know, we'll have, you can apply for remote work, we'll have 20% of our workforce or so working remotely, and other folks will have a lot more flexibility. So we see that Google, this cost Google many millions of dollars, I can guarantee you that, and I have some inside sources of the company, for top people leaving to replace them is very expensive. And then, of course, morale took a huge hit to this issue because clearly people felt not listened to. And of course, they had to change their plans around their offices, all of that layout that cost Google millions of dollars. Now, just a month later, Amazon had the same thing where it wanted its employees to go back to the office actually Monday for Friday, nine to five. And due to the same sort of employee resignations and resistance, it eventually said, okay, we'll give you a lot more flexibility in coming to the office. Again, many, many millions of dollars. Same thing happened just a week ago in, with Uber. Uber had the same thing. We want all employees to go back to the office Monday, Friday, 9 to 5. Well, due to employee opposition resistance, the resignations, it said that, okay, we'll, we'll allow you to, <laughs> to work much more flexibly. And Apple also wants its employees to go back to the office. And it's also facing serious internal opposition and resignations. And so it may also change its path. We'll see what happens with Jamie Damon and co. But clearly, companies are making some really bad decisions. Managers are making some leaders, top leaders. I mean, these are trillion-dollar companies. These are the biggest companies in the world. Amazon is the biggest company in the world. You know, Google is closely followed. And, you know, Uber is not as big. But, you know, Apple is pretty, pretty much, you know, up there as well. Horrible decision-making, costing them many, many millions of dollars. Many millions and even more in reputation and employee morale and productivity. Why are they making these bad decisions? Well, they're talking, that's due to the dangerous judgment errors that they make. And we'll talk about that soon. I just want to pause myself and give you a chance to ask questions. You set me up for my next comment, Gleb, which was, uh, you know, what are some of the cognitive biases that drive these decisions? And I guess the, the other thing I would add is that um, the uh, from the data that you're providing and the examples of big companies like Google and Amazon and so on, it would really behoove any manager now, uh, particularly those that have not yet tried to force their employees back into the office to take this into account in their own decision making and say, uh, OK, uh, if it's not working for these big companies that are some of the more desirable places uh, to work on the planet, uh, how are my employees going to feel about it? Uh, but anyway, why, why don't Gleb? Uh, in your book, you make the point that uh, these decisions about forcing people back into the office are often due to cognitive biases based on uh, the, on the part of the managers involved. What are some of those biases? Well, just before getting to that, I want to talk about some middle market companies. I gave a webinar for Vistage, which is a peer executive organization for middle market companies. It has many thousands of middle market companies that says CEOs and leaders. And they took some surveys of all of their leaders. They found that less than half actually took, had did surveys of their employees to ask their employees for the preferences and going back to the office. So clearly middle market, I mean, that's ridiculous, to be honest. If you're not doing surveys of your employees, you are kind of deliberately leaving yourself blind. What they're mostly doing is talking to the other C-suite officers and che checking on senior VPs and checking for their information and opinions. So clearly leaders of the middle market companies are making some bad, bad decisions as well. And this has to do right, yeah. with- Well, let me interrupt you there for just a second. Sure. Uh, being, being the neuromarketing guy, I guess I, I could push back and say, well, people uh, aren't going to tell you what they really think on surveys because they can't. Uh, they are driven by their own biases and unconscious motivations. And then the other thing is, uh, depending on how you structure that survey, it's like, if you say, okay, would you prefer to come back to work five days a week in the office or would you like the option of working from home for part-time? Uh, you know, who is not going to say, no, I want to work from home part-time or at least have that option. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I wonder how, uh, how much 
managers can rely on these surveys. Or if you are going back to Jamie Dimon, he probably saw those same kind of surveys and said, well, yeah, of course, people don't like to compute, but uh, commute. But so what? Uh, you know, let's uh, uh, you know, we want them back in the office and they're welcome to find a job someplace else if they don't want to come back in. And I hear you. And that's fair from the perspective of not wanting to hear from your employees. But that's a very big problem if you then have to end up reversing your decisions as happened with Uber, Amazon, Google. You don't want to be in that position. They lost millions and millions of dollars. Smaller companies will lose hundreds of thousands, middle market companies, small businesses will lose thousands and thousands. You know, small business that has 10 employees and if they're trying to force those back to the office, if three of those employees leave, you have 30% turnover. That's pretty horrible for you. So you don't want to be in that position. Right, that, I that's, think it's a fair well, point, one. Glad. Second, I worked with 12 companies to help them transition to back to the office, have a strategic plan. And I had them all do surveys. Employees were pretty transparent. We did have a number of people say they want to go back to the office full time. Something ranging on various surveys from 10 to 20%, depending on the company. Then you had something like 30 to one survey so showed 60% of people wanting to work remotely, fully time remotely. And then most people, something in the 60%, like 70% percent range wanted part-time work one to two hours per week. So you definitely have surveys that are clearly giving information as long as you structure them appropriately and anonymously. You are getting good data from those surveys. Mm -hmm. And that's representative of what employees want. And employers, like you said, sometimes just don't want to hear from their employees. They want to go to the information that they prefer to hear. So they go to their managers, the fellow supervisors, leaders, and they say, well, you know, this is what we want to do. And our employees will, will, will take it. They'll tolerate it. Maybe they don't like it, but they'll be okay with it. They'll tolerate it. And this speaks to a cognitive bias called the false consensus effect. The false consensus effect relates to how we perceive other people. Cognitive biases, by the way, are the dangerous judgment errors we make because of how our mind is wired due to our evolutionary heritage. We grew up, our, we evolved for an environment in which we lived in tribes and when in the savanna environment as hunters gatherers. So we had to have a very strong fight or flight response and very strong tribalism. The false consensus effect relates to tribalism. We feel that other people in our tribe hold pretty similar beliefs to us. And so the leaders at Uber, Amazon, Google, felt that their employees were similar enough to them that they could judge their employees' reactions based on their own reactions. Clearly, that was wrong, very wrong. And many middle market companies, many small businesses will make the same sorts of mistakes. I can guarantee that to you. And they will make bad mistakes and they will lose a lot of money. And they can afford to lose much less than, uh, than a Google or an Amazon or an Uber. So it's kind of one cognitive bias. Another cognitive bias has to do with experience of managers. They became successful through in-office work, through in-office spending their time, and they were leaders. So they, be, they progressed through their careers. They had 30 to 40 years of in-office experience. They feel comfortable, overwhelmingly comfortable with in-office work. They feel uncomfortable <laughs> overwhelmingly with working from home. They also don't see their employees working and that feels bad to them. They feel they don't have accountability and oversight and they feel that they're not surrounded by their employees. And these are pretty social people, gregarious people, the kind of people who tend to become leaders. And so they are uncomfortable, they're extroverted. So this personal discomfort relates to a cognitive bias called the status quo bias, where we want to maintain a status quo, this current situation or get back to it. And the status quo for these leaders is work in the office. They feel that it's wrong. They're uncomfortable with not working in the office. And so they try to force their employees back into the office just because they want that personal comfort rather than looking at the bottom line for their companies. Clearly, Uber, Amazon, and Google had it wrong. And many other companies will make bad mistakes similar to that. And even not getting the information, not running the survey, speaks to a cognitive bias called the confirmation bias, where we tend to look for information that confirms our beliefs and not if we look for information, ignore information that contradicts our beliefs. 
And finally, these leaders have a certain perception of what it means to work remotely. There were major transitions in March 2020, the lockdowns. This fast transition resulted in them transposing in-office culture on remote work. This is obviously not the optimal way to work remotely. You need to create structures and systems optimized to remote work. But they try to work remotely using their in-office culture. And that relates to a cognitive bias called functional fixedness, where we tend to perceive that there's one way, right way of doing things, one right set of systems and processes, and not adapt it to a new situation. It's like the hammer tool idea that whenever you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So when you have an office culture, everything looks like that. And now they see, well, remote work is bad, but because they're approaching it wrong and they're doing it. One change that I think will be occurring is offices are going to be redesigned, assuming that some of the people will be remote some of the time, at least. Maybe some people will be remote all the time, uh, but probably in most offices, there'll be some kind of a hybrid approach. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's going to be attention in office design, because what you're going to want to do is encourage collaboration during those in-office times. But uh, also, I saw, I've seen articles that suggest that uh, the open office is dead. People are going to have uh, more barriers, uh, more private offices, uh, more separation in order to make people feel safe. And so you've got, on the one hand, you're trying to increase the collaboration, but at the same time, uh, there's this other uh, dynamic that says, well, maybe we should keep people farther apart. <laughs> how, how do you see that playing out? So I already helped 14 companies transition back to the office. Overwhelmingly, my recommendation for companies is to do hybrid, mainly hybrid. Most people succeed most in the hybrid environment where they do their individual work better at home and their collaborative work better in the office. Some people can be successful full-time remotely, and I encourage folks to allow these employees to work full-time remotely, but that's a minority, maybe 10 to 30% of your workforce. Large majority is going to be hybrid coming in one to two to three days a week. These companies, they definitely, we talk to them, encourage them, and they do transition their office. And the way they transition their office is, first of all, they determine requirements. Now, the best way for decision-making around returning to the office is to let lower-level team leaders make the decision on what's going on for their team while allowing those employees who can succeed in working remotely to work full-time remotely. Then you know, kind of know what your capacity will be. Let's say people on average will be coming in two days a week. Now, you need some basic sort of office space before, for your various financial functions and so on, administrative so maybe 20% of your office space you need. But if you have people coming in 20, two days a week and you have 80% of your office space dedicated to occupancy, then you maybe only need 50% of the space that you had before the pandemic. And you can cut down your office space. It's a great saving. So companies are finding they're saving a lot of money by cutting office space and office-based services and products, janitor, security, and so on, large commercial printers. So that's kind of one step of redesigning your office. Then the second step is overwhelmingly changing it for collaboration. You're going to shift it from individual cubicles to open off to open office designs with hot desking, or not necessarily open office designs, but hot desking of various sorts. Some offices, it depends on whether they're allowing unvaccinated people to come in. The most of the companies with which I'm working are only asking vaccinated people to come to the office. So it's pretty safe. Everyone's pretty safe and they're, they, do, they are reserving, they're mostly keeping an open office arrangement for hot desking activities. There's nobody except leaders who need private spaces for conversations have closed offices or cubicles. The large majority of the office space, something like two thirds, is dedicated to collaboration because that's what people overwhelmingly do when they come to the office. That's why they're coming to the office. You know, why come to the office except if you're doing collaboration? People tend to be much more productive at home at their individual tasks. So for collaboration, you need things like conference rooms with high quality video technology for people who are coming in remotely. So kind of those hybrid meetings. And you need informal collaboration spaces like lounges and so on for those more casual, spontaneous collaborations. So that's the redesign of the offices that's happening very much 
in the companies that I helped and that I'm seeing in other companies as well. So I'm talking, I know I work with some architectural firms where we help refer clients to each other that are seeing the same sort of trend in other companies that are changing their office. Are there any good ways of improving that sort of remote presence uh, where you've got uh, one or more, say, attendees in a meeting who are remote and everybody else is in person? And we've seen some of these sort of, you know, robots with iPad faces and such on there. But uh, I, I'm curious whether you've seen anything uh, new that really seems to be effective. Well, it's all things that seem to be effective, namely making sure to pay attention to this person and making sure to call on them deliberately. Now, what happens is that these people tend to be left out of conversations. So the leader, the team leader as a facilitator needs to be trained. So this is about training training the lower level supervisors on effective virtual team facilitation, team meeting facilitation, and in general virtual collaboration. They need to be trained on how to facilitate hybrid meetings effectively. That means paying quite a bit more attention to the people who are in the room virtually. You don't need the you know, space dogs with faces, <laughs> those robots. That's not necessary. What needs, what, it's a human thing, it's attention. These people need to be attended to. So pay attention to them, focus on them, call on them throughout the discussion, weigh their opinion heavily, and make sure that they are fully represented in the discussion. That's a matter of facilitation. So training for facilitation needs to be a part of adapting to the new hybrid office culture that will be the main office culture going forward. We're seeing that overwhelmingly the what companies are doing right now is what they intend to do going forward. And most companies are choosing some kind of hybrid arrangement. Before we wrap up, Gleb, uh, I'm curious about your uh, time spent studying the history of behavioral science. Uh, how did you happen to choose that field? I don't think that um, behavioral science historian is uh, a common entry in the career guidebook. Uh, but uh, also, you know, what, um, how far back, well, we think of behavioral um, science as a relatively recent thing. How far back uh, does one trace its roots? But uh, first, how, how did you end up in that field? Well, what I end up in the field, so what history of behavioral science involves is looking at historical situations and contemporary situations, if you're looking at contemporary history, and then applying behavioral science methods to analyzing it. So looking, for example, for cognitive biases in the decision making of leaders, looking at where debiasing might have been helpful, where you know, some of the methods that people use are already addressing some of the cognitive biases. So looking at the history of how cognitive biases, how decision making happened in historical settings. And so that's what fascinated me. I was always interested in history and I was always interested in decision making. So I brought my two loves together and looked at how people are making decisions in historical and contemporary settings. In fact, my dissertation looked at young people and decision making in the Soviet Union and in the United States in the 40s, 50s and 60s, looking at their cultural leisure activities and sort of decision making around government policy toward those sorts of issues. So it's, that's, the, that's the key. You look at these issues in historical and contemporary science. So really, uh, sort of um, history major through a behavioral science lens, exactly. I guess. Yep. Uh, exactly. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's really fascinating. Uh, that will have to be the topic for another conversation, Definitely. Gleb. Because I'm sure we could have a lot of fun with that, too. Uh, Gleb, how can people find you and your ideas online? Well, first, they can find the book, Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams, a manual on, benchmark, on benchmarking to best practices for competitive advantage on Amazon. That's the easiest place that folks will find a digital hard copy. So check that out. My own resources are going to be at disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Blogs, videos, podcasts, online classes, good books, of course, decision-making guides, manuals, coaching, consulting, training services. And check out a free course on making the wisest decisions. It's eight video-based modules with an assessment on cognitive biases as part of the first module. It's the assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace. Check that out at disasteravoidanceexperts.com forward slash subscribe. Great. Well, we will link there and to any other resources we mentioned on the show notes page at rogerdooley.com slash podcast, where we will have audio, video, and text versions of this conversation. Gleb, thanks for coming back on the show. Really appreciate you inviting me, Roger. Thank you very much.